You're listening to Let's Talk Creation, the science podcast that's just for you. Is there geological evidence of a worldwide flood? So I suppose, oh goodness, what does it what does it mean to be geological evidence? I suppose is where you might begin, but but that's a big question. I, we're not going to answer that in ten minutes, but see what you can do. Yeah. Okay. Well, I think um, the first thing to say is that we'd expect that a catastrophe on the scale and duration of the flood described in the Bible um, would leave abundant evidence in the Earth's geological record. Um, so we ought to see evidence of such an event. Sure. But I think whether we can perceive that evidence in the geological record depends to a very large extent on the interpretive framework that we adopt um, when we consider the Earth's geology. Um, most geologists today have adopted um, what we might call a uniformitarian framework, mm -hmm. uh, which basically views present-day processes as the key to then interpreting and understanding how the ancient rock strata were formed. And I think if, the, if that's the lens through which we view geology, then it's probably going to be very hard for us to see the evidence of a worldwide flood, even if it's there. If, on the other hand, um, we accept the Bible's testimony to a worldwide flood, then I think that interpretive lens makes much less sense uh, because, you know, a flood of the kind that the Bible describes um, would have involved processes operating at scales and intensities, you know, much greater than any that we observe today. So I, I guess the, the question really is, can, do we see features in the Earth's geological record that are better explained by the catastrophist model of a global flood? or by the uniformitarian framework that I've, sure. that I've just mentioned. And I think the answer to that is, um, is yes, uh, we, we can perceive features like that in, in the Earth's record, uh, geological record. Um, one very obvious uh, example, I think, of an evidence for a worldwide flood is uh, that we see extremely widespread, catastrophically deposited um, sedimentary strata uh, this is a per pervasive feature of the Earth's geological record. Um, we see many individual rock units, which are incredibly extensive geographically. You know, they cover a huge area. Right. Mm -hmm. And they display features that are consistent with catastrophic deposition. So let me give you an example. Um, uh, in the southwestern part of the United States, um, there is a rock unit called the Shinnerump Conglomerate. Shinnerump, uh, that's a great name. <laughs> Shinnerump. Yeah, it's a great name. Um, and the Shinnerump Conglomerate is basically um, a remarkable sheet-like um, rock unit that covers parts of northern Arizona, southern Utah, parts of several other states. It's thought that originally it probably covered something like 140,000 square miles. So, you know, this is a huge uh, rock unit. And yet it's not particularly thick. Um, it averages somewhere between about 50 and 100 feet thick. Um, it can reach 350 feet in, in some places. Um, so it's a relatively thin but extremely extensive rock unit. It's composed of... Um, lots of pebbles and cobbles of a very hard uh, rock called quartzite. Um, we also find petrified wood in the Shinnerump conglomerate, including some very large logs. The pebbles that we find don't match any local source, so it looks as if they've tr been transported some considerable distance before they were deposited where we find them today. Um, and also the Shinnerump conglomerate is cross-bedded. So it has this inclined layering, um, you know, within the rock unit, which indicates that it was deposited by um, fast-flowing water currents. 
And it's very hard, I think, to visualise how a rock unit like the Shinarump conglomerate could have been deposited under present day conditions. Um, we, we simply don't have any good modern analogue for such an extensive blanket of, of conglomerates. Um, you know, we just don't have anything quite like it today. But on the other hand, you know, if you think about the, you know, what we might expect from a worldwide flood, then perhaps we can begin to make sense of the Shinarump conglomerate. You know, it's very broad, sheet-like, mm -hmm. extensive um, nature. Um, the, the fact that, that the pebbles and cobbles in it have been transported long distances by fast-flowing water. You know, all of that is exactly what you might expect from a worldwide flood. Now, you know, conventional geologists have tried to explain the Shinarump conglomerate in other ways. Uh, they, they propose, for example, that it, it was perhaps... Um, deposited by a network of braided streams and that the uh, deposits yeah. of these braided streams kind of coalesced to eventually give this very extensive blanket of conglomerate. But it's hard to see how that really explains well the the very broad sheet-like nature, the uniform nature of the Shinarump. Um, it's a, the fact it's a that big most, stream. It, yeah, and it would yeah you know, covering a very large area, and you'd have yeah. to have all those deposits coalesce in a very uniform way. We do see some evidence of channeling in some places, um, you know, mm -hmm. cha channel erosion below the Shinarump, but in most places we don't. In most places, the Shinarump has a very flat contact with the underlying rocks, which is not really what you'd expect of, you know, a braided stream network. So you know, it seems to me that you look at a rock unit like that and. Um, I can see that a worldwide flood could explain how a rock unit like that formed. And it's one of many, many similar examples. You know, this is not a unique example. The other thing, you know, probably worth mentioning, you know, we've been talking about the remarkable persistence of an individual rock unit there. But also we see some pre pretty astonishing global scale patterns in the geological record. Uh, so, for example, since the 1960s, um, geologists have recognised that sedimentary rock strata are grouped in thick packages that um, geologists call sequences or mega sequences. Um, they're basically bounded at the bottom by a very extensive regional erosion surface and also at the top. So we have these erosion surfaces that kind of bound a, a thick package of sediments. Mm -hmm. um, these sequences were first discovered actually by geologists uh, who were working in oil and gas exploration and a typical sequence comprises um, at the bottom you get conglomerates and sandstones and then they're followed by um, mudstones or shales and then those are followed by limestones that's a sort of an, a typical sequence and so what you have there is you have um, what geologists call a fining upwards sequence. So you have okay. mm -hmm. the, the size of the sedimentary particles get smaller as you go up through the sequence. So the coarsest material is at the bottom and the finer material at the top. And there are six of these mega sequences that have been identified across the North American continent. Uh, the lowermost of these sequences is called the Sauk sequence, um, S-A-U-K, Sauk sequence. And it's represented, for example, in the Grand Canyon of Arizona um, by three major rock units. So at the base of the Grand Canyon, we have the Tapetes sandstone. That's followed by the Bright Angel shale. And then that's followed by the Muav limestone. So there you have your fining upward sequence. Mm -hmm. There you've got your sandstone followed by shale, followed by limestone. Right. But what's even more remarkable is that that sauk sequence can be traced across the whole continent. So the basal sandstone that's called the Tapete sandstone in Grand Canyon stretches right across North America um, uh, from, east to, from west to east, and you also find it from the Mexico border right up into Canada. Um, it's given different names in different places, so it's given lots of different local names, um, but it's basically all part of a single extensive sheet of sandstone. And then what's even more remarkable than that is that 
um, we see similar um, Sork sandstones on other continents. So, you know, if you go to Europe or if you go to the Middle East or to Africa or to South America, in effect, we have similar sandstones at the same place in the geological record. So this seems to be a kind of transcontinental or global scale pattern. And, you know, when, when you see global scale patterns in the geological record like that, that, that demands a, a global causative course, mechanism. Yeah. And I think that we have that mechanism in the biblical record of a global flood. So I do think, you know, when we look at the, the Earth's geological record through the right kind of interpretive lens, then I think we do see evidence that's consistent with a global flood. Yeah. yeah. So it's it's kind of like um, when you're too close to something, it's hard to see. Yeah. Uh, that's that's happened a lot in the history of science, where yeah. people don't recognize what they're looking at because it's so large that you can't really take it in very well. Yeah. And so that's it's not surprising to me that that conventional geologists would say, ah, there's no evidence for the flood because they're thinking of, you know, just a river flood. You know, they've seen those yeah. kinds of floods or a tsunami. They've seen that. Um, yeah. So just imagine yeah, so that. People, Big. <laughs> so, sure. So people people are often looking at, on the wrong scale, right? Yeah. So they're, yeah. they're thinking, where is this individual flood layer that we that we should find? I th they're, they're not thinking on a grand enough scale for something like the, the global flood described right. in the Bible. I, right. I just think we've, we've got to kind of have a bigger vision in order to perceive what the evidence is really telling us. So you just heard a clip from the Let's Talk Creation podcast. If you'd like to learn more about the podcast or hear the full episode, check out corsi.org slash podcast. Or hit the notification bell, hit subscribe, hit like, and you will see our podcast episodes on your regular video feed. Thanks.